Welcome, and it is my pleasure welcoming our audiences to this lecture at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, in cooperation with the Center for Israel Studies at American University in Washington, DC. Um, and I say audiences because the necessity to hold this meeting online does enable us to bring together audiences worldwide. Uh, thus, I welcome our viewers in Germany, the United States, Israel, and wherever you are. When the United Nations were founded as a family of nations in 1945, no one predicted that we all would be so close and so far away at the same time. And ever since Israel joined this growing family as its 59th member state in 1949, the relations between the Jewish state and the United Nations have been complicated. On the one hand, the state of Israel was created by the United Nations as a result of its adaptation of the partition plan of Palestine. On the other hand, no other state has become so vilified by this organization, especially during the 1970s and 80s, as was the case with Israel. At times, there were actually more resolutions against Israel than against all other member states combined. And in 1975, as many of you know, Zionism was condemned by the General Assembly as a form of racism and racial discrimination, a resolution that was revoked by the same institution 16 years later. So I am very glad that today we have an expert with us who will lead us into the discussion of this heated topic with a cool head. Dr. Glad Ben-Noon is the Israel Institute visiting professor at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich this semester. And my special thanks go out to the Israel Institute. He also serves as a senior researcher at Leipzig University's Research Center Global Dynamics, where he teaches global studies and the history of international law. He's a former EU Marie Curie Fellow at Verona University's Law Faculty, a former Ford Foundation Fellow, and a former UNDP Middle East Program Officer. His first monograph on Israel's reception of African refugees was nominated for the 2017 National Jewish Book Award. His latest book is on the drafting history of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Dr. Benun received his PhD and Habilitation from the University of Leipzig with previous degrees from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He will speak to us for about 30 to 35 minutes and after that, he and I will discuss some of the issues mentioned, followed by and answers. You will see the Q&A button on the bottom left of your display. And please feel free to write your question either during or after his lecture. Our event will last roughly an hour with some more space for your, for your questions if needed. And let me also say, that this event will be recorded. So with no further ado, the floor is yours, Gilad. Thank you, Michael. And um, thank you to Ludwig Maximilian University for inviting me uh, to be this year's visiting professor for Israel studies. Um, thanks to the Israel Institute in DC for helping us uh, make the wherewithal for this happen. And a last debt of gratitude goes to you, but especially to the wonderful friends and colleagues back at the Jewish Studies uh, Department in LMU for making this such a welcoming experience, notwithstanding this, this weird COVID-19 um, condition. It is 75 years exactly since the UN was born in San Francisco. It was born out of failure. The failure was that of the League of Nations and the collapse of its collective security regime, which culminated in the unprecedented horrors of World War II. 75 years on, and despite countless challenges, <clears throat> the UN and its adjacent agencies have not only grown in size, but have also proved indispensable for the world's truly global governance. As Tommy Cole, 
the renowned Singaporean ambassador to the UN and the chairman of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea has recently stressed, quote, the UN has many more successes than failures. The civilization we enjoy would not be possible without the UN and its family of agencies and entities. To the UN's architects back in 1945, the organization's prime responsibility was that of maintaining international peace and security. Pandemics, international economic development, the lifting of people out of poverty, human rights, and even the shift from colonialism to self-government were all important objectives. Yet it was the prevention and amelioration of violent armed conflict, which lay at the heart of the organization's raison d'être. Over the years, the UN has been confronted with many clashes, yet none have frustrated and perturbed more than the Israeli-Palestinian one. Known as the mother of all conflicts, it has consumed both resources and organizational focus disproportionately. It has clouded and overshadowed many other conflicts, some of which have been far more lethal and bloodletting. These other conflicts have suffered from a dearth in resources and much needed UN management attention, which the organization simply could not muster, being consumed as it were with this challenge. Alas, it's still alive and kicking today. So has all this effort and frustration over the past 75 years been in vain? In what follows, I wish to paint a slightly different picture. I wish to argue, somewhat optimistically, that in its engagement with this seemingly never-ending, stubborn, non-reticent conflict, the UN has improved immensely. It has developed tools, procedures, and an organizational ethos which its architects did not bestow it with. I argue that through its engagement with the Israeli, Palestinian, and Arab conflict, the UN elaborated these mechanisms and tools so as to provide ad hoc solutions within the Near Eastern context. Yet once in place, these tools could, and indeed were, successfully applied in other conflict settings. In short, through its harsh and frustrated engagement with this conflict, the UN and its family have become better in what they do elsewhere. Against these words, the critique of steely-eyed realists echoes loud, and rightfully so. The UN is anything but perfect and certainly basks in its fair share of flaws and failures. Its conduct in Sri Lanka in 2009 upon the overt targeting of Tamils by Sinhala Buddhists is a case in point. So is its grotesque behavior in Myanmar vis-a-vis -vis the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya there. Seen in this light, the resulting skepticisms begin to feel less like a trickle and more like a deluge. It is with this challenging skepticism that I try to wrestle here. To begin with, one should note that the Israeli, Palestinian and Arab conflicts have served as the laboratory for the development of the law of international organizations. The UN in fact grew into the already existing Arab-Jewish conflict which it inherited from the League of Nations. And thus, from its inception, the UN was immediately struck with a series of firsts brought upon it by the Arab-Jewish confrontation in mandatory Palestine. By series of firsts, I mean the condition under which the organization had, for the first time, to deal with cardinal issues to which it could not derive satisfactory answers from its own existing UN Charter and to which it was coerced to respond institutionally. Via the establishment and laying down of practice, it had hitherto never undertaken. Consider the following. The Arab-Israeli conflict triggered the first convening of a special session of the UN General Assembly on anything under provisions of, of Article 20 of the Charter. Over the years, many more special sessions would follow. It triggered the establishment of the first UN Special Committee on anything, as per Article 21 of the Charter, UNSCOP, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. It was, the first, it was the first time the creation of two new UN member states 
were called for by the Assembly. It was the first conflict where UN Special Representative Secretary General, Folke Bernadotte, was ever nominated, and the first time a UN delegate ever lost his life on mission, Bernadotte in Jerusalem. Many more, including Secretary General Hammarskjöld in the Congo and Under Secretary General Sergio de Mello in Iraq, would follow. Jerusalem in 1948, more specifically the King David Hotel, and you see it here with the Red Cross flag, and the YMCA, which is here with the Red Cross flag, where's the YMCA? There. <laughs> was the first where the International Committee of the Red Cross had officially installed a weapons-free civilian safety zone within urban warfare under what would become Articles 14 to 18 of the Geneva Convention. By the way, this is standard practice today, Syria, Afghanistan, and so forth. The Arab-Israeli conflict was the first place where peacekeeping was ever applied, first as a truce observer force deployed in Jerusalem, 48, and so forth, and later as the first UN armed peacekeeping force deployed in Sinai in 1956. In 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was the very first definition of the construction of civilian settlements in militarily occupied territories as a war crime, Article 82B8, was specifically written into that statute with reference to Israel's practice in the West Bank, the quote so-called the transfer directly or indirectly in the, in the statute. In, in 2018, Israel was the first country ever to be charged with a breach the 1965 UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. This list is merely cursory, yet its argumentative thrust is clear. For 75 years now, the Israeli-Palestinian and Arab conflict have remained at the very center of international attention. And each time a new historical situation arose in Palestine, the UN came up with a new organizational practice for that instance, which it later applied elsewhere. So where and how did this series of firsts, so to speak, alter the UN's capabilities for the better? Let us begin with peacekeeping. Nowadays, probably no other UN action is more associated with the organization's fundamental tasks. Correspondingly, in 2020, UN DPO, Department of Peace Operations, was by far the largest UN agency in terms of expenditure and personnel dwarfing its second and third largest agencies combined, the Secretary of the UNHCR. Given its primacy and sheer size, one would assume that peacekeeping was at the organization's very core from the start. In fact, the opposite is true. To begin with, the words peacekeeping do not exist anywhere in the UN Charter. In any manner or form, the UN's architects certainly did envisage armed intervention, as per Chapter 7, Article 42 of the Charter. Yet permanent peacekeeping was not in their cards. The first quasi-official peacekeeping mission was enacted by the League of Nations back in 1925 with Swedish officers shotting both sides of the Greek-Bulgarian divide. This is the so-called Demir Kapu conflict. Yet 20 years and another world war later, it was again Swedish officers trotting both sides of an armed divide, uh, by this time in Jerusalem in 1948, that laid the ground for the groundwork for the, work, for the UN's peacekeeping the world over. In 1956, and I love this photo, right? uh, upon yet another war between Israel and its Arab neighbors, the UN emergency force in Sinai became the first international armed UN mission ever to be deployed. This was the Cold War. The US and the USSR could diverge on Berlin in 1953, on Budapest in 56, on Cuba in 61, and of course on Vietnam. Yet on Palestine, ever since that very first special session of the General Assembly back in 47, the US and the USSR were in total accord be it on the need for Palestine's partition, on the deployment of military observers in 48, or in this case, on the need for an impartial armed UN presence in Sinai. Over the years, some 73 peacekeeping missions have been deployed the world over. 
In the best of cases, where peacekeeping morphed into UN custodianship as in East Timor and Kosovo, new states which embody the justified self-determination of their peoples came into being. What began as a haphazard and cautious experiment in military observation in 1948 in Jerusalem had evolved into an enabling capacity for new states to emerge from violent conflict settings. Kosovo and East Timor are not, were not easy places. East Timor and Kosovo today are most certainly not perfect, yet they are far better off for their own peoples and for their regions than they were back in 1999. A second example where events in the Arab-Israeli conflict came to shape global policies concerns the relationship between the UN and regional organizations. And this relates to one of the most famous and most often quoted international documents from the second half of the 20th century, UN Security Council Resolution 242. This resolution adopted in the aftermath of the Six Day War, which called for an Israeli retreat from the territories it gained in exchange for peace and recognition by the Arab states has served as the bedrock of a two-state solution braced on the so-called Green Line. Given the countless articles, monographs, MAs, and PhDs, I think I have a PhD or an MA proposal at least once a year on Tukutu, written about it, is there anything really left to say about 242? Its famous expounding of territories rather than the territories and the discrepancy between its English and French versions have now become standard exam questions in faculties around the world who teach their introductory courses on modern international law. Yet with all that said, far too little has been said about 242's vital significance for the UN's own cause and clout. For at the end of the day, it was in 242 that the UN laid down once and for all the clear and correct hierarchical relationship between itself as the superior global actor and regional organizations as its subordinates. Chapter 8 of the Charter, Articles 52 to 54, spell out rather clearly this hierarchical relationship between the UN and regional organizations. Indeed, states are encouraged by the Charter to work through regional organizations with the caveat that, and I quote, no enforcement action shall be taken under regional arrangements or by regional agencies without the authorization of the Security Council. As is well known, this entire chapter of the Charter was introduced into it at the request of the Organization of American States, the OAS. Six years prior to 242, in October 1961, it was the US who requested the, the authorization of the OAS for its installment of the maritime quarantine against Cuba during the missile crisis. The OAS's unanimous approval of the quarantine subsequently lay the ground for that famous showdown between Adley Stevenson and Ambassador Zorin at the UN Security Council, where Zorin promptly found himself in the quote, court of world public opinion, to use Stevenson's famous phrase. A similar sequence of events took place in the Middle East six years later in 1967. Following conflictual developments, the Six Day War, a local regional organization, the local regional organization, in this case, the Arab League, also set a course of action vis-a-vis -vis what it considered as a rogue state actor within its regional sphere, Israel. Back in 61, the OAS saw Cuba in the very same manner. On the 29th of August 67, the striking parallels between the conduct of the Arab League and that of the OAS in Cuba continued. Paralleling the latter's unanimity on the quarantine, the Arab League also arrived at its own unanimous vote imbibed in its famous three no's of Khartoum. No to peace with Israel, no to its recognition, and no to negotiations with it. Yet there was one glaring difference between the OAS of 61 and the Arab League of 67. Prior to the missile crisis, the UN had never intervened in Cuba. Yet as early as 1947, the Middle East was the UN's primary theater of diplomatic operations. Few things had become more harmful for its credibility 
that the Egyptian demand of the UNEF's United Nations Emergency Force immediate withdrawal from Sinai on the 16th of May 1967. The UN Secretary General Zotan Spunatsa on the 22nd of May and his blunt and empty-handed return to New York had, and I quote, hereafter inspired Israel's refusal to place her vital interests again in United Nations hands. This is Abaya Guzmi. With the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, what would become the African Union in 1963, and the official establishment of ASEAN, the Organization of Asian Countries, merely three weeks before the August 67 resolution in Khartoum, it was high time for the UN to lay its down its law vis-a-vis -vis regional organizations correct place within the international system. And that is exactly what 242 meant for the UN, namely one big exercise in the management of its relationships with regional entities. Against Khartoum's quote, no peace with Israel, 242 stressed, and I quote, every state in the area and their right to live in peace. Against Khartoum's no to the recognition of Israel, 242 stressed Israel's right to live, and I quote, within secure and recognized boundaries free from threats and acts of force. And lastly, against Khartoum's no to negotiation with Israel, 242 instructed the UN Secretary General to, and I quote, designate a special representative to proceed to the Middle East to establish and maintain contact with the states concerned in order to promote agreement. If that is not nominating a negotiator, then you'd better find another word for it. In reality, this was the explicit negotiation mandate bestowed upon Gunai Ari. 242's last and arguably largest nail in Khartoum's coffin does not appear in that resolution's text, but rather in its footnote. 242 was endorsed unanimously, 15 votes to none. Bulgaria and Canada, the US and the USSR, members of NATO and members of the Warsaw Pact affirmatively agreed upon its text. So did arch rivals such as China and Japan, and so did non-aligned countries at the Security Council, such as India and Ethiopia. 242 was just as much about restoring the correct hierarchy between global and regional, as it was about ameliorating a specific given clash. It was about restoring the UN's global credibility after Otan's humiliation by Nazi, just as much as it was about setting the parameters of land for peace in the Arab-Israeli conflict. In years to come, much blessed cooperation would take place between the UN and regional organizations. Yet when it came to bloody conflict, the UN remained in the driving seat to be buttressed, as it were, by its regional allies. This was the case for Alvaro de Soto's negotiation in 1992 of the 1992 peace accords in El Salvador on the UN's behalf with the support of the OAS, the UN's cooperation with the African Union, both in peacekeeping, Darfur, and in mediation, think for example the Rift Valley Agreement, has continued to abide by this hierarchical pattern. My third example regarding how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict might have ameliorated the UN concerns the International Court of Justice. The UN Central Judicial Organ, the ICJ, which this year celebrates its centenary, established as the PCIJ in 1920, is rightfully considered as the highest of international courts, la grande dame, in the words of the late Antonio Cassese being the only organ of the UN which remained identical to its League of Nations predecessor, the ICJ's stature has seen its fair share of demise and rise, ebbs and flows over this last tumultuous century. International lawyers do not have a Nobel Prize for their achievements, yet they do have the honor of delivering the general course at the Hague Academy of International Law, the so-called Recoil de Course. In 1958, it was the Jewish Jacob Robinson, who received that year's honor. The topic he chose rings some bells, the metamorphosis of the United Nations. The subtitles of his roughly 100 page lecture, which came to explain just how much the UN had changed during its first decade or so, included the, follow the following headings. Listen carefully. From community of purpose 
to instrument of national policies, from enforcement agency to organ of diplomacy, from constitutional rigidity, the charter, to empirical flexibility, things beyond the charter. And most importantly, the last subtitle, from the rule of law to the rule of the majority. Reading these titles some 60 years later, they seem just as pertinent today as they were when Robertson discussed them in The Hague back in 1958. His general approach to the UN was, in his own words, an affirmative one. Yet what seemed to him the most alarming phenomenon threatening this institution's future was the possible demise in the ICJ's stature. Alarmed by a UN member state sidelining of the court, Robinson warned that, and I quote, all friends of the rule of law have observed with great anxiety a tendency to boycott the court and virtually put it out of business. The years after World War II did not bode well for the causes of international law. This disappointing Koskinianian gentle civilizer of nations on whom so many hopes were pinned during the interwar period failed to civilize anyone, let alone Nazis in concentration camps, communists in gulags, or Maoist cultural revolutionaries. During those early years, it should be noted, the court also contributed its fair share to its own demise. For at the end of the day, within its early advisory opinions, it was simply not doing a good enough job of international legal reasoning. And in its second advisory opinion, on reparations of injuries suffered in the service of the United Nations, it was none other than events in Palestine which made the court look professionally bad. Triggered by the assassination of the UN's first mediator there and setting out to prove it had its own separate international legal personality, the ICJ metaphorically tripped over its own open shoelaces when it chose to base its opinion upon the 1946 Convention on the Privileges and Immunities. The UN was formally not even a part of this convention, nor was it its official beneficiary, private people group. In short, the ICJ, and I quote, missed the point by a considerable margin. And as Young Clubbers has pertinently noted, this was not the court's finest moment at any rate. Yet as the years went by, the court gradually and painstakingly asserted itself, working laboriously through the territorial disputes of the decolonized world and through its repeated protection of self-determination from Namibia to Namibia to Western Sahara. In Nicaragua versus the United States, 1986, it placed itself firmly on the side of objectivist justice. In doing so, it also seized on the opportunity to adjudicate over the Fourth Geneva Convention for Civilians, the very treaty which was catapulted outside of its purview back in 1949. In 2004, some 45 years after that first advisory opinion, which stemmed from events in Palestine and which tainted its image, the ICJ was faced once again with an advisory opinion on that very same small strip of land. Now it was torn between its two native peoples who loved, cherished, and yearned for it. And it was also physically torn, literally, by a wall of concrete and fences and iron gates, which the late Meron Benvenisti termed as the rape of the land, aimed at its violent expropriation, rather than a legitimate obstacle to terrorism, which could have been erected on the existing green line. If ever there was a tour de force pronounced by the ICJ, then the 2004 advisory opinion on the wall is it. Sifting through the minefield of legal arguments against its jurisdiction, the court courageously and rightfully insisted that this was not a political question, but a legal one. Israel's occupation of the West Bank came fully under its obligations with regard to the applicability of the Fourth Geneva Convention for Civilians. There was not a country in the world, nor any international organization for that matter, who accepted Israel's intellectually dishonest claim that it did not apply. This convention was drafted four years after the liberation of Auschwitz by three Holocaust surviving Jews, 
ז'ורג' קהן סלוודור, גאול קורן, וניסים אבורך. And it was Rabbi Dr. Cohen who single-handedly drafted Article 49, Paragraph 6, which prohibited the transfer of civilians into militarily occupied territory by the occupier. If this convention was not applicable to occupied Palestine, it was not applicable anywhere. And Cohen would turn in his grave. That grave was in Nazi-free Copenhagen, to which he returned from his exile in Sweden after being saved in a fishing boat. by his heart-loving Danish Gentile neighbors. Much has been written about the ICJ's 2004 advisory opinion, most of it claiming it as a Palestinian victory. Yet a careful reading of the opinion reveals just how brilliant and just the ICJ really was in its pronunciation. The saying goes that Jewish imagination consists of paranoia confirmed by history. In paragraph 78 of the opinion, the ICJ most clearly stated that all the territories east of the Green Line and west of the Jordan River were occupied and were not part of sovereign Israeli territory. And it is here in their paranoia that Israelis and Jews elsewhere have failed to recognize their own sweet victory in this opinion. For any reading of paragraph 78 immediately bids the a contrario conclusion. If all the territories east of the Green Line are occupied ones, then all the territories west of the Green Line are sovereign Israeli territory, plain and simple. While this might seem obvious, the fact of the matter is that the Green Line demarcated no more than the 1949 armistice. It was certainly not an internationally recognized sovereign border. The ICJ's advisory opinion made it just that. The last official UN map of the Jewish state was drawn up by the UN General Assembly in its resolution 181 back in 47. The UN's executive being the Security Council, which could have drawn such a line in 242, refrained from doing so as it left the line blurred between territories rather than the territories. And like in any Montesquieu-based governance structure, when the legislator, the General Assembly, and the executive, the Security Council, continue to beat around the bush, it remains for the judiciary to set the record straight. How good a judiciary it is when it can bring forth victory to both parties under the most acute and adversarial circumstances. Back in the 12th century, it was Maimonides, the foremost of all Jewish com legal commentators, who wrote, and I quote, every judge who judges to the utmost truthfulness, even for one hour, it is as if he has repaired the world in full. How appropriate are these words to the ICJ's 2004 advisory opinion. The UN has certainly not been innocent of its faults, in its seven decade engagement with the Israeli-Palestinian and Arab conflict. In 2012, this, this, this one is, I hate reading this, this part of the lecture. In 2012, and against the explicit demands of the Secretary General, UNESCO adopted a resolution which condemned Israel for, and I quote, the creation of a new Jewish prayer platform south of the Maghrabi ascent in the El Burak Plaza. The mythical creature with the head of a woman, the body of a horse, and the wings of an eagle, Al Burak, which according to Hadith, not Quran, carried Muhammad in his night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, was centered in, the, in UNESCO's resolution. Al Burak, right there. The Western Wall Plaza was left in double inverted commas. Back in 2000, during the Camp David talks, it was Arafat who told Clinton that the Jewish temple never existed on the Haram Sharif. So let the Jews look for their temple elsewhere. That the highest Palestinian dignitaries should deny the ontological origin of the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount is deplorable. Yet when the UN agency mandated with the custodianship of humanity's cultural heritage succumbs to the same logic 
the entire UN family's credibility is torpedoed. Interestingly enough, in its 1925 officially printed guide to visitors, that's the guide, the Muslim Holy Waqf of Jerusalem explicitly stated that the Dome of the Rocks, and I quote, identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. In 2016, the Oxford English Dictionary chose as its word of the year the word post-truth. It denoted circumstances, and I quote, in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. As it turns out, UNESCO of 2012 was far more prone to post-truth than the Palestinian High Muslim Holy Waqf of 1925. The worst, of course, comes from the UN Human Rights Council and its predecessors, the Human Rights Commission. Back in 1983, it was the Syrian Defense Minister, Mustafa Glass, who wrote a book called The Matzah of Zion, which reiterated the 1840 blood libel where Jews allegedly killed Christian children to make Passover bread using their blood. In 1991, after the Syrian ambassador to the UN in Geneva openly stated that all delegates should read this book, it took the president of the UN Human Rights Commission five full months of continuing deliberations to, be, to belatedly condemn this blood libel accusation which the Syrian delegate made on that Geneva floor. In 1997, the Palestinian delegate to the commission stated that Israel was injecting Palestinians with HIV positive blood transfusions. Yet even here, the situation has improved somewhat in recent years. As the Brookings Institute has recently noted, and I quote, while Israel Palestine continues to occupy a significant amount of the council's agenda, states are clearly starting to expand their attention to include a more diverse array of country specific human rights issues around the world. Thus the tools which the UN Human Rights Council might have initially applied horribly and disproportionately towards Israel are gradually beginning to turn towards all human rights violators. It is probably not for nothing that Russia, China and Saudi Arabia scrambled this year to be allocated a rotating seat at the Human Rights Council. With questionable human rights records of their own, they rightfully figured that their interests would be best served by sitting close to where decisions were being cut. Otherwise, though, this year has seen some remarkable changes in the Israeli-Arab relations. These include two peace, new peace treaties, normalizations, prospective rapprochements, and as of yesterday, the buying of half of Betal Yerushalayim by the Emirates. Interesting. In tandem, a remarkable regional realignment is emerging before our eyes. Israel has openly joined the Sunni military rank and fire with stretches from the Jazeera up to Egypt. This front faces a newly devised northern Shia crescent, which now stretches continuously from Tehran through Basra via Syria to the Hezbollah controlled Mediterranean Lebanese coast. In its geology, the Middle East has always served as the epicenter of the great African Asia rift. Yet this current tectonic shift of, Israeli, of Israel's alignment with the Sunnah against the Shia is distinctly political, notwithstanding its, its dramatic seismic qualities. Within this shift, the UN is by and large sidelined. In the General Assembly's usual manner, this week saw yet another round of five anti-Israel resolutions tabled and adopted by automatic majorities with voters in favors, including human rights champions, such as Belarus, Pakistan, Turkey, and Venezuela. Yet this is not the UN as such but its member states. And thanks to its harsh experiences in Palestine, which also imbibed it with its own international legal personality, the UN as an institution is legally independent from these member states. It ought to assert this dear independence it was given so as to promote its good causes. For in the same week, this week, UNHCR cared for tens of thousands of Tigrayan refugees fleeing a new Ethiopian civil war. UNICEF concluded a deal with 350 logistical suppliers around the world to begin the planned distribution of COVID-19 vaccines to third world countries. The UN World Food Program, which alleviated the hunger, listened to the number of 600 million 
690 million people was awarded this year's Nobel Peace Prize. And UN Habitat in Nairobi published its 2020 World Cities Report regarding the value of sustainable urbanization. Back in 1945, the architects of the UN could not have imagined how its work would acquire the truly global scope it currently has. Several of the most cardinal stepping stones towards this global purview were taken ad hoc within the Israeli-Palestinian and Arab conflict. As it stepped up to those challenges, the UN developed its tools, procedures, institutional memory, and so many of its agencies, which simply did not exist when the UN Charter was written. In fact, one could safely say that the UN today does more things beyond the chart, such as UNICEF, the World Food Programme, and UN Habitat, than the futile anti-Israeli General Assembly statements that are part of the Charter. What matters is what the UN does, far more than the non-binding Assembly statements, which some of its member states tend to make. And much of what the UN does, it does so because it did it first in Palestine. Thank you.